Hello everyone, today we are going to start a new module and this module is related to the materials that are used in the construction of concrete pavements. As we have discussed previously, if you remember that the typical materials that are used and are related to concrete pavement other than the granular materials and subgrade, it includes dryline concrete mixes and it also includes pavement quality concrete. Both in DLC and pavement quality concrete, we use cementitious materials in different forms, in different proportions and this is what we are going to discuss. Today we will discuss about the cementitious material which act as the binding agent when we talk about concrete mixes. Just like the previous modules, in this module also various sources were referred in different lectures and these references have been mentioned in this particular slide and I greatly acknowledge them. So, what are we going to talk today? We are going to talk about cement in general where we will cover topics related to production of cement, we will talk about the theory of hydration, we will talk about the basic physical and chemical properties of cement, uh, we will also talk about the different types of cement that are typically permissible to be used for the construction of concrete pavements. We will talk about pozzolanic materials which are used to form cementitious material, we will discuss about them and we will also discuss about the uh, current trend on the use of a geopolymeric material which is basically a replacement of cement. So, we will discuss about the theory related to the production of geopolymeric cementitious materials as well. Let us start discussing about these topics, this particular module is a short module in comparison to the previous modules. So, we will try to complete this module in two lectures and today is the first lecture where we are going to talk about the production of cement, we will discuss about the theory of hydration and we will also talk about the physical and chemical properties of cement. So, to start with let us see uh, how the development of cement started in the history. If we see the literatures that are available, the uh, sources that are available that tell us about the various structure that were uh, built long back, we see that cementing material were initially adopted by Egyptians, Romans and also Indians in various different forms. Of course, these were not the typical cementitious material we use today. But the theory of cementitious material uh, is ideally developed from our understanding about these structures, about the materials that were used as a binding agent in these structures. Egyptians, they basically used cementing material that were produced by burning gypsum. And just for further reference also, you can try to remember that gypsum is nothing but calcium sulphate hydrate. So, it is CaSO4 2 H2O. So, they used gypsum uh, as the cementing material, but of course, gypsum is not the only material which we use today for the production of cement. Greeks and Romans on the other hand, they produced superior material uh, in comparison to what the Egyptians produced and they used a mixture of lime and some form of volcanic ash. Now, the volcanic ash is basically rich in aluminosilicate minerals. So, here again is a very basic concept that cementitious materials are in general developed by a combination of uh, calcium oxides for example, through lime and aluminosilicate materials. Now, the source can be different uh, for the aluminosilicate materials, but ideally when these materials are mixed together in some form and they undergo through some specific processes, finally we will get our cementic product. So, it, Greeks and Romans they uh, used to mix lime and volcanic ash which reacted slowly in presence of water to produce a hard mass or a cementing material. The term Portland cement or the, the initial uh, manufactured cement that was used in the modern age was basically a successor of uh, hydraulic lime that was produced by burning clay limestone. And this was uh, investigated and it was developed by John Smeaton in 1976. So, uh, he found that you know uh, burning some specific types of clay limestone through a specific process again, you can get a cementing product. Portland cement 
uh, which we understand today was actually invented by Joseph Esbdin, who uh, mixed and grounded limestone and finally divided clay uh, into the form of a slurry. So, what he did? He took limestone, he took clay material, grounded them, mixed them together, uh, formed a fine slurry out of it and this slurry was further placed inside a burning chamber which we also call as a kiln and it was heated to a very high temperature. Okay. And during this process, the calcination of this combination of material um, uh, will take place and because of this calcination process, the carbon dioxide is liberated and he continued the process of heating until the complete removal of carbon dioxide. Further, after calcination, whatever was the material uh, which he got, uh, what he did? He grounded it to fine powder. Now, this fine powder is nothing but the cement uh, which is termed as or denoted as Portland cement because of its resemblance uh, with the uh, natural stone which was found in Portland which is in England and uh, this is how the name came in. But uh, the Portland cement we manufacture today uh, is not exactly the material which was proposed by uh, Joseph Esbdin because the procedure has evolved over time because uh, it was understood that when Joseph Esbdin mixed limestone and clay in finely divided form and heated it, the temperature was not very high so as to convert it into a clinker. So, clinker again is a, a product which we get uh, you know uh, during the manufacturing process of cement, uh, but uh, his temperature was not so high. Later on uh, other researchers they uh, used higher level of temperatures so that this mixture of limestone and clay gets converted into clinker and finally this clinker is grounded and it is further mixed with some additional materials for example gypsum in some proportion uh, and we finally get our product which is cement so talking about the raw materials that are used in the manufacturing of the modern cement which we understand it includes calcareous material now this is the basic principle of manufacturing the cement uh, and, and this principle was in fact taken from the experimentations that were done many many years back and we are just evolving with time refining things in the manufacturing process and uh, producing various types of cementing materials. But the principle as I mentioned will remain the same. So, we will have a calcareous material, uh, the common calcareous material or the source is basically lime or chalk through which we get abundant amount of calcium oxide and the argillaceous material which comprises of silica and alumina. So, these three things you have to remember that cement is composed of a mixture which undergoes a process that is a different thing, but the raw materials include calcareous material. So, we need a source of calcium oxide and argillaceous material which, which means we need a source for silica and alumina, a mixture of silica and alumina. Okay. And for example, the commonly uh, commonly used source is clay or shale for the argillaceous material. Now, uh, to modify the properties of cement, other raw materials can be used as well. For example, we can use silica sand, we can use some proportion of iron oxide, we can use some proportion of bauxite which is basically which contains hydrated uh, aluminum uh, to get you know some desired composition. But the first point tells us the basic ingredient that is required. Some of the additional raw materials, now when I say that these are raw materials which means uh, it is uh, basically used mostly as a replacement of you know other materials which are already listed here. So, uh, because ultimately what we need is the basic ingredients that is uh, calcium oxide and silica and alumina. So, there are of course other sources other than lime or other than clay or shale that can give us this product and so they can also be used. For example, we can use blast furnace slag. So, blast furnace slag which comes as a byproduct from the industry, it consists mainly of lime, silica and alumina. Again, the ingredients which are required for the manufacturing of cement and it is mixed with calcareous material because the quantity of lime here is not significantly high to initiate the um, process or the reactions which finally uh, converts these raw material into cement. So, we need to add blast furnace slag with 
additional calcareous material uh, of high lime content. We can also use kaolin, kaolin is another form of clay, we also call it as a white clay and it contains uh, some iron oxide and it can also be used as a replacement of argillaceous component for the production of white Portland cement. We can also use uh, industrial wastes, for example, fly ash is one of the very common industrial waste. Uh, we no longer even call it as a industrial waste these days. Uh, we have to purchase fly ash, but typically it is a byproduct from thermal power plant and uh, this can also be used as a replacement of cement. So, this is a type of pozzolanic material about which we are going to discuss in detail anyway in this particular uh, module. Now, let us see the manufacturing process of cement. So, the manufacturing process of cement it consists mainly of four stages. So, what are these stages? These stages includes crushing and grinding of the raw materials. So, we have the raw materials, we have silica alumina and we have calcium oxide. We will mix them, we will crush them and we will grind them together. So, this is the first step. Now, we will also control the proportion of these materials. So, uh, we are going to uh, blend this material in some certain proportions, so as we get the final desired property that we want. Then what we do? We burn this particular mix which we have created uh, that is the mixture of lime, alumina and silica and any other materials if it has been added. So, uh, we will mix them and finally, this mixture will be burned in a kiln and in the kiln which is basically a chamber uh, and we uh, add the material here, the mixed material here and then we have flames uh, you know. So, there is a differential temperature in this particular kiln. So, we heat the mixture uh, from it uh, you know uh, to a level of temperature ranging from 1300 to 1500 degrees Celsius and during this process when this material comes here under the action of heat and it uh, comes out of uh, this particular chamber, it will convert into clinker. So, clinker are basically small nodules of the products which are formed uh, through the chemical reaction or the calcination process and additional and other processes which takes place inside this particular uh, chamber. Finally, uh, the clinker which we get which comes out of the kiln, we cool it actually and then we ground it. Then this grounded mixture is basically added with about 3 to 5 percent gypsum and we get our final product as the cement. Now, let us talk a uh, few important points related to these steps or these stages. For example, if you talk about grinding and mixing of raw materials, so there are two different processes or three different processes that can be used. So, we have a dry process of manufacturing cement. In the dry process, when we are grinding and mixing the raw material, they are in dry state and they are mixed through compressed air. So, it, it will be a moist condition, but still we call the process is dry. In the wet process, we actually add additional water. So, what we do? We grind individual materials and when we mix them, we mix them with water to form a slurry. Okay? And this slurry can be actually stored uh, in tanks and they are continuously agitated to maintain the homogeneity. The amount of water uh, can vary on the final product we desire, usually it is 35 to 50 percent. Now, again try to imagine here more is the quantity of water, more amount of fuel will be required in this kiln and in fact, the dimension of the kiln will also increase because you have to dry the product. So, this is an advantage of dry process, even the size of the kiln will be smaller in comparison to the si size of the kiln we use in the wet process and the amount of heat that will be required will be lower in comparison to the wet process. So, I think that is very clear uh, when we talk about drying this mixture when it has to pass through the process. We also have semi dry process which is not very commonly used, but in, but in this process what we do? We typically add 10 to 14 percent water to mix uh, these materials. As I mentioned that is the slurry or in the dry form if it has been compressed through air, finally the product has to come to the top of the rotary kiln. And this is an inclined steel drum as I have already discussed. Uh, so, it is made up of steel. Um, the dia of this drum uh, can range from 3 to 8 meters, whereas the length can vary from 30 to 
200 meters uh, again depending on the process we are adopting. And inside the rotary kiln, uh, finally the clinker will be formed when the mixture is subjected to high temperature, they will break down into certain particles, we will be discussing about those particles. <coughs> so, this clinker is typically small nodules uh, whose size varies from 3 to 20 mm and it is formed uh, due to the chemical reactions within the kiln which is finally cooled, stored, they are grounded with addition of 3 to 5 percent gypsum before we get our final product. So, these are the steps and some important points in the process of manufacturing of cement. Uh, these two pictures it shows uh, you know the process in different form. For example, this is a flow chart for the wet process. As I mentioned, we have limestone, we have clay. It goes through wash mill, we, we wash and then we will uh, you know uh, store the clay in storage bins. Limestone are of larger sizes, so we have to crush it and then we store it in the storage bin. We mix them together. Okay. Uh, so, we have wet grinding mills to make slurry. So, we will add as I mentioned a uh, certain percentage of water. This is finally stored in again storage tanks and then we have to insert it into the rotary kiln where it forms clinker and then we use a ball mill to grind the clinker and mix it with 2 to 3 percent gypsum and finally, we have the cement silos or the storage tank for the final product. Uh, this gives again from a study I have taken uh, this particular flow chart which shows the dry process. Here again you see we have uh, limestone, we have clay, fly ash can also be added alright. So, uh, finally, they go through the grinding process, they are stored, then finally, we are allowing them to move and reach the um, kiln. And here again it will pass through the process where it will get converted into clinker and there we will finally grind it, mix it with gypsum and we will store our final product here. All right. So, I think this flow charts are self explanatory and we have discussed the process of manufacturing of cement. Okay. So, this is what happens in the kiln as I mentioned uh, the temperature is differential here. So, because we are heating, so this part will be of lower temperature in comparison to this part and material will enter here. So, when material will enter here, it will have certain percentage of moisture. So, the free water will go, then depending on the temperature, the clay will decompose, the limestone will decompose, they will get fused together and they will form several products. So, uh, for example, they will form dicalcium silicate, they will form tricalcium silicate, they will form um, uh, tricalcium aluminate, they will form tetracalcium aluminoferrite and so on. So, we are going to discuss about these products now. As we have discussed that the raw material basically consists of lime silica, alumina and iron oxide and these oxides finally interact in the kiln to produce complex compounds. Let us discuss about the typical proportion of these oxides. So, uh, calcium oxide which is basically limestone has the highest quantity. Uh, which is about 60 to 67 percent. For example, in the last flow chart which you saw there it was used as 70 percent. Then we have SiO2, Al2O3 which will basically come from argillaceous material. SiO2 ranges from 17 to 25 percent whereas Al2O3 ranges from 3 to 8 percent. We have Fe2O3 which ranges from 0 0.5 to 6 percent. We have magnesium oxide 0.1 to 4 percent. Then we have also again depending on the raw material source, we will we can have certain proportion of alkalis in form of potassium and sodium oxides and the quantity is though very less 0 0.4 to 1.3 percent and we can also have sulphates uh, 1.3 to 3 percent. Now, these are where the raw materials. Now, let us talk about the materials that are formed in the kiln that is when these materials are mixed heated together and then are allowed to stay in the kiln for certain period of time. Then uh, again these are approximate compounds because the exact composition or chemistry is a more complicated to explain. So, therefore, uh, you know to explain the terms in a more uh, simpler way, uh, uh, we refer these compounds as Bogues compounds uh, who basically uh, you know categorized uh, these uh, materials which are formed inside the kiln. Okay. So, they can be 
understood as tricalcium silicate. So, it is denoted as C3S. Okay. We have dicalcium silicate that will be formed C2S. We have tricalcium aluminate which is denoted as C3A. We have tetracalcium aluminoferrite which is denoted as C4AF and depending on the again the percentage of raw material, depending on the property of the raw material, the proportion in the process and it also depends on the process we are adopting. So, the proportion of these individual components in which will be formed inside the kiln will change. And in fact, this proportion is very critical to the final properties of the cement which will be used as an engineering product to make structures. All right. So, therefore, controlling this proportion is again uh, very, very important uh, to get the desirable properties from the final product. Because all these individual products as we will discuss uh, uh, you know so, uh, very soon in this presentation that these products have to finally, come in contact with water to form the final binding agent. And when they come in contact with water, the reaction becomes more complicated with the individual components and uh, you know different, uh, different further compounds will be formed. Uh, amount of heat will be released and all, all these attributes, all these parameters will finally affect the strength of the structure uh, where we will be using this cement as the binding material. So, uh, talking about the typical proportion of these ingredients, so tricalcium uh, silicate uh, is mostly of the highest proportion about 30 to 50 percent, then is dicalcium silicate around 20 to 45 percent. We have tricalcium aluminate and tetracalcium aluminoferrite relatively the percentage is uh, less. It is like C3A is about 8 to 12 percent and C4AF is about 6 to 10 percent. So, these two uh, materials or ingredients that is C3S and C2S are basically controls the strength of the final hydration product or of the final structure. On the other hand, the other products that is C3A and C4AF though they do not contribute significantly to the strength um, of the final uh, concrete, uh, but uh, they you know tends to um, dictate the other properties of the hydration for example, uh, or, or final properties of the cemented product which we get. For example, the setting time it will control the presence of uh, other reactions involving the uh, you know production of uh, atrignite and so on. So, let us talk about the hydration. So, as I mentioned the final binding agent will be formed or the final product that will impart strength to the structure will be formed when the cement comes in contact with the water. So, the chemical reaction that take place between cement and water it is referred as the hydration of cement. All right. Now, in the hydration process, hydrated products will be formed and these products will impart the cementing and these products have basically cementing and adhesive properties. Talking about now we know that there are four main products which will be formed in the kiln is not it. So, among those four products C3S and C2S they will react with water to form calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide. So, C 2 S or C 3 S plus water will give us something which is called as calcium silicate hydrate. So, this is a cementing gel plus calcium hydroxide and it is it will also liberate heat which means that this reaction is an exothermic process okay. uh, and they make up to 50 to 60 percent of the total hydration products that are formed uh, during the reaction of cement and water. If we now compare uh, C2S and C3S, so C3X reacts very fast with uh, the water. So, it dictates the early strength of the cement. So, the early strength of the uh, cement uh, with, uh, or, the, or the hydrated product is basically due to the presence of C3S. Okay. But again we have to remember that C3S emits higher amount of heat in comparison to C2S. So, though C2S reacts slowly, uh, it is responsible for the later strength, 
but the amount of heat production is less in C2S. So, uh, it is more desirable to have larger amount of C2S in the cement in comparison to C3S if we talk in terms of strength and desirable properties. Uh, because again uh, amount of calcium hydroxide which is produced by C3S is much higher than the amount of calcium hydroxide that is produced by C2S. And why we are talking about calcium hydroxide and comparing C3S and C2S? Because larger amount of calcium hydroxide is not desirable in the cement or, or in the hydrated product. Why it is not desirable? Because calcium hydroxide has a tendency to dissolve in water and once it dissolves in water, it will make the concrete porous which is not desirable. Calcium hydroxide, it constitutes almost 20 to 25 percent of the total solids. Now, other problems related to calcium hydroxides includes its reaction with sulphates. So, it reacts with sulphates in the soil all right during the process, it will form calcium sulphate. Now, this calcium sulphate when it comes in contact with C3A that is tricalcium aluminate, it will form calcium sulphate aluminate all right and this basically product will affect significantly the strength of the concrete for which we are basically using cement and this process is also called as sulphate attack. So, there will be change in volume of the uh, concrete, there will be loss in strength of the concrete because of the production of calcium sulphate aluminate. And from where it is coming? It is actually coming from calcium hydroxide. From where is calcium hydroxide coming? It is coming from the reaction of C3S and C2S with water. And who produces the highest amount of calcium hydroxide? C3S produces. That is why when we compare C2S and C3S, it is desirable to have higher amount of C2S in comparison to C3S. But a benefit of calcium hydroxide, uh, though it is not very significant here to discuss, is that it maintains alkalinity in the concrete. And this alkalinity will help in uh, offering resistance to the corrosion against reinforcement when we talk about reinforced concrete. However, even a smaller quantity of calcium hydroxide is sufficient to give resistance against corrosion to the reinforcements and therefore, higher amounts are not desirable. Now, talking about the other two products that is C3A and C4AF, it should be C4AF. Um, which are formed inside the kiln. So, they react with water and gypsum. So, gypsum also we added in the uh, you know in the process of manufacturing of cement. So, they react with water and gypsum to form something which is called atrignite. Now, this atrignite can further initiate the process or further reaction to produce monosulphates also. So, these atrignite and the presence of monosulphate, they do not contribute to the development of strength in the concrete, rather they can affect something which we call as the interfacial transit zone. So, when we have like core segregate and we have cement paste over it, so this location becomes very important at how well the coarse aggregates are bonded with uh, the cement paste. Now, if the amount of pores here are more then the concrete can show early failure. And less is the amount of pores here which means we have a good bonding, very close bonding between the coarse aggregates and the uh, cement paste, the strength of the concrete will be higher. And these products which we are talking about the presence of atrignite, higher amount of calcium hydroxides, the reaction which goes on they produces crystals and this crystals can occupy this space between the cement paste and the aggregate particle thus affecting the final strength of the concrete. If you remember we talked that when uh, after the materials come the clinker when it comes out from the kiln it is grounded and it is mixed with gypsum. So, the question is what is the importance of gypsum? So, the importance of gypsum is that uh, it delays or it, it will reduce the occurrence of flesh set in the cement. 
this flash set is a very fast reaction because in absence of gypsum C 3 A will uh, produce products uh, which will uh, quickly set the cement and it will make the cement hard. So, in order to prevent the flash set due to the very fast reaction gypsum is added which retards the reaction of C 3 A all right. Uh, among all these uh, products which we have discussed so far, our interest is basically in understanding the calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide because they are directly related to the mechanical strength of the concrete. Though other products are equally important, but with the manufacturing with the modern manufacturing process, we are well able to control you know the negative effects of these products and by controlling these proportions, we are also able to manufacture various types of cements for specific construction purposes. Uh, well, uh, these graphs uh, just show that how uh, the different fractions vary with time because hydration is a process uh, which goes on for many, many days. So, initially the reaction is fast and then the reaction becomes slow which means the strength gain uh, in the final hardened cement is basically time dependent and with time the strength increases all right. So, let us see that how with time the hydration of different products go on and then how different products help us in the uh, help us to gain uh, higher compressive strength. So, if you talk about the product like C 4 A F and C 3 A. So, you see the fraction hydrated are very very high here all right in the initial period and they they have a constant slope and it will then cease uh, after certain number of days. On the other hand uh, if you see C 3 S initially it is very high then after some time it will stabilize C 2 S on the other hand it reacts very slowly. So, the fraction hydrated are very less initially and then it increases over a period of time. So, that is why we say that it helps in the uh, later strength of the concrete. <clears throat> if you talk about the contribution of different products, different components on the compressive strength. So, you see the uh, contribution of C 3 A and C, C 4 A F are relatively lower in comparison to C 3 S and C 2 S and you see that initially C 2 S has a lower contribution, but after some time it almost matches with C 3 S which is responsible for the high early strength. So, let us stop here today uh, though I was expecting that I will be able to complete uh, the uh, discussing about different tests on cement, but I think uh, we have to wait for the next lecture and in the next lecture we will complete our discussion uh, on various common tests that are done to characterize cement. Thank you.